Edward C. Byers grew up in a small town, with aspirations at a young age of being a Navy SEAL. Not only would he go on to become a Navy SEAL, in a 21-year career as a special warfare operator, he would go on to earn multiple citations, and even the Medal of Honor. During the night rescue of Dr. Joseph, in Tongi Valley in Afghanistan. I saw somebody that was about, you know, 20 feet away from me, starting to present a weapon towards me, and I was able to engage him and make some very clean shots uh, in his head and, and dropped him. Joining the military had a lot to do with the time in our our nation and the type of video, you know, movies and books that were starting to come out. And growing up, even though that my dad was in a Navy veteran, he never, he didn't talk about much and of that. And we flew a flag on our farm, but it, the military was never a thing. The movies like Navy SEALs had just come out. Uh, books about SEALs in Vietnam had started coming out and it was just fascinating. It was really cool technology. I wasn't allowed to own a gun growing up. I never hunted when I, growing up. Uh, and so watching this stuff though, as a as a young man on TV and reading these books, it was just fascinating to me. I think that was the catalyst of that, why I wanted to join the military. There is no way to describe what Buds is like. You are cold, wet, sandy, and miserable for eight months to nine months. And that's if you make it all the way through without getting injured or, or getting rolled back. We started off with 200 people plus in our class. We came out of a hell week with a very large number of people. I think it was well in near like 90 people. And we graduated with only, I think 23 or 24 original members of our class. So it was a 90% reduction. I happened to be one of those uh, original members. So the psychological impacts and the physical impacts of that are second to none. I fractured my tailbone a couple weeks, I mean, a couple days before Hell Week started. So I went through Hell Week with a fractured tailbone. I wasn't able to do sit-ups or anything like that. Uh, I was colder than I've ever been in my life. Uh, even despite the fact that it was the at, towards the end of the summer when we were going through our training. And there were times when you have a, you know, come to Jesus moment and go, can you physically make it through this type of this stuff? My biggest sense of pride and joy, I think really came at the end of Hell Week because that was the culmination of my entire upbringing of wanting to become a SEAL and knowing that that was, at least in my mind, the hurdle that was gonna have to, can you make it through Hell Week? It's five and a half days, at, we had three hours of sleep. You run well over 100 miles with boats and telephone poles, and it's pure exhaustion. You don't sleep for the first, you know, three days. That right there is, it's really hard, you, you know, processing that. So there's a video that I still have, fortunately, back in the day when there was really no video because we didn't have cell phones, of are the commanding officer coming over the berm, uh, which is in, you know, Coronado, is where the base is, and with the American flag and securing our Hell Week class on a Friday morning. And after he got done saying your class is secured, something happened, and I'm the only person that did this, that just let out this roar. And I, the roar probably lasted 10 plus seconds and the entire class is turning their heads, looking at me. And I was so, I was so proud in that moment because I was a kid from small town America that had no insight into what the military was and Buds is renowned for being the hardest training in the military. And I just accomplished something that I would say, outside of a handful of people in my life, nobody thought I could do. Nobody thought that that was possible. That for me was an immense sort of pride and accomplishment 
Fast forward to the end of our, of, of our graduation component, it was a sigh of relief. Thank God this, this, is, this has been a long time in the making because you have a, an additional seven months on the backside of that called SEAL qualification training. So it was nearly a year and a half of pure nonstop training and it was a sigh of relief of going, okay, this part of my career is done. Now it's time to go to do the job for real because we're in the middle of a war. And what does that bring? I got asked with a couple other of my uh, teammates to move out to Western Iraq near the Syria border called Rawa. And we helped stand up a base out there that was, it was a Marine Corps base. What had happened on that deployment was the thing that was an action that changed the course of my life. Um, Clark Schwedler, Petty Officer First Class Clark Schwedler, was doing a direct action mission uh, outside of Fallujah when he was uh, fatally wounded. And Clark was one of my very close friends and, and teammates. And that drove the catalyst for me wanting to try out for Naval Special Warfare Development which is commonly referred to as SEAL Team 6. And in May of 2011, we conducted uh, the, the Bin Laden raid, which I was blessed and fortunate enough to play ever so small a role in on that operation and being, uh, being part of that team. And then just a handful of months later, on an, uh, August 6, 2011, we had the downing of Extortion 17. And the downing of Extortion 17 ended up becoming the greatest single loss of life in special operations history. We lost 30 Americans and an Amer a military working dog. And in an eerie nod to the call sign of that helicopter, we lost 17 SEALs. And so in an instant, a, a third of one of our units was lost. What ended up happening out of that was they decided they had to reconstitute the loss of what was called, known as two troop from a gold squadron and so they decided to pull individuals from other squadrons to reconstitute this lost troop i had the honor and privilege of being one of those men and i came over from blue squadron to make up the new two troop it was very significant because we talked about culture in the past and every unit has its own little aspects of its the way they, they conduct their business and their culture is slightly different even though we're all SEALs. And so it was the first time in the history of our entire organization where we had this immediate mixture of, of squadron personalities. And so everybody was wondering if we could rise to the occasion and be very integrative. That We became known as the new two troop. And it was a year later that we deployed right back to the same place in Afghanistan in Fob Shank and started conducting uh, combat operations in and around the same area, which was known as the Tangi Valley. And Tangi Valley was at the time was the most dangerous place in all of Afghanistan and it was the valley in which Extortion 17 was shot down just a year prior. Well, in early December, we started to get intelligence reporting that an American doctor had been taken captive. He was going over to do a Doctors Without Borders thing and had linked up with a few other Afghan doctors and then come to find out they had turned on him and then they turned him over to the Taliban who then you know, took him uh, captive and was more than likely was going to use uh, Dr. Joseph as a as a bargaining pawn to help, you know, release some uh, captive combatants that the U.S. had. Well, the, how our mission came about so quickly was we started to get intelligence reportings that they were going to get he was going to get moved over to Pakistan. And typically when that happens, you're almost for sure going to lose contact with that person and, and then the survival rate is going to drastically start decreasing as time goes on. And so our unit uh, 
Spun up on this target, we developed the intelligence picture as fast as possible. And on the night of December 8th, we launched out of our base and landed about uh, five hours away and started patrolling into the target. Now what we did differently, and, uh, and it was, a, a, again, a nod back to our SEAL brethren in Vietnam and how they used to attack targets going through the, the Mekong Delta, you know, the hardest way into the targets, we, we took on the same approach because the way our target building was positioned and where we thought the, the doctor was being held captive was in a compound that overlooked the entire valley. valley. So there was no way to walk up the front, uh, up the valley to the compound because we, despite it being at night and with even low loom, at, once your eyes adjust, you can see across the valley plain as day, especially with as many people as we had and, and trying to move that those type of forces. But this compound was to the back, it was butted up right to the back, uh, the bottom of a mountainside. And so we came up, up the backside uh, to that mountain and then had to walk down the face of that mountain. What we didn't know was, because there's only so much you can get from looking at the, and doing route reconnaissance was, how steep it actually was. And there was points where our team was turned around, bouldering down the side of the mountain and using our ladders to get down from level to level to level. There was no clear path to do that. So it really cut into our time. When we all finally got down to the bottom of the, bit of the mountain and we got to our set point, we started to hear calls of prayer throughout the valley and in the very, off in the very distance, started to see the sun started to peak up first light. And so we knew we were right on the cusp. No more time to waste. It was at that moment uh, that Nick Check, our point man, started to lead out our, our patrol and started moving towards the target building, our area of responsibility. Now we were there with our entire, our, our entire troop and the compound had many buildings and many places that needed to be hit simultaneously. So our team started to fan out and started taking their areas of responsibility. Our specific team, uh, Echo Team, which was being led out by Nick Check, moved to our target building and that we had assessed is where the uh, Dr. Joseph was being held. And so as we started to get closer to the building, one of the uh, Taliban guards had come out of the door with, uh, with his rifle and Nick Chek immediately engaged him and that started the, the catalyst of us rapidly accelerating our prosecution of the target. Nick took shots at him and began sprinting and moved in such a fashion that by the time I had a chance to react and started to maneuver to gain some space between us in case I had to also shoot. He was already six to eight feet ahead of me. It was an instantaneous shots on target to uh, forward progression to the door to, to prosecute this building. When we got to the building, which was you know only you know, 20 to 30 feet away at this time, the door, we, we encountered something we had never encountered before on all of the prior years of doing combat operations. It was a, it was wool blankets that was multi-layered and, and uh, cemented into the door frame on opposing sides. And so shots had already been fired and in a hostage rescue mission, we had to move because if they woke up and decided to execute an American hostage, it is mission failure and we do not do what it is we're designed to do as a military unit. And one of our first mission essential task list is to do hostage rescue. And so we, a couple of us hopped on these blankets to try to rip them out of the door seam. And they were cemented in so well, they couldn't do it. And it was, even after a couple seconds, it was, we heard a voice from our troop chief. He said, get the hell inside there, let's go. You know, we were talking about a matters of seconds here. There, was, there wasn't a long delay in time, but, but seconds were hours in, the, in this environment right now. And so, 
Uh, as Nick started to weave his way through, there was more gunshots. You can't really see what was happening because you were, you were having to push away multi layers of blankets, these heavy wolf, you know, blankets. And it's very difficult too because they're getting it's getting hung up on your gear, your guns, your night vision, all that stuff. I moved in right behind uh, Nick, and I had stepped over something or, or someone moved into my area of responsibility, uh, which was to the left. And as I came in and presented my weapon, I saw somebody that was about you know 20 feet away from me, also starting to present a weapon towards me, and I was able to engage him and make some very clean shots uh, in his head and, and dropped him right there. But it was a matter of just split seconds of him getting shots off on me versus the other way around. It was at that time that I noticed somebody scrambling across the floor that was moving towards those weapons. And by the time I was able to close with that person, I was able to lock them down on the ground, uh, pinning them to the ground with my knees on their shoulders as I was adjusting my night vision to gain facial recognition. This entire time this person is grabbing, trying to reach for these weapons and grab something. And while I didn't know if this was one of the hostages that was scared and was trying to move because there was no voices at this time, there was no, nothing was being called out. And it was roughly in that instance that we began to call out for Dr. Joseph, like somebody, you know, is he in this room, will he say it? And there was no response, there was no response. And this is all happening in just matters of seconds, right? So, after a few more of these call-outs to Dr. Joseph, the, we finally, I finally hear this voice, I'm over here, I'm over here. And it was not the person I was on top of, and it was a voice that was coming to my, from my right-hand side. And so I made the decision to shoot the person that I was on top of, and whether it killed him or subdued him enough, I was able to then jump off of that person and uh, I leapt across the room and was able to jump on uh, Dr. Joseph because there's still shots are now flying throughout this room. And so I jumped on Dr. Joseph to protect him with my body armor. It just happened to be by the, by the grace of God that one of the other uh, you know, Taliban was within arm's reach of me. And I was able to hold Dr. Joseph against me with body armor and within arm's reach, I was able to reach over and pin that person against the wall by their throat. And fortunately what that had done was just given enough time for our the rest of the team to get, make it inside and eliminate that threat. And so once that threat was eliminated, we went through uh, doing the standard protocol of, you know, asking him if, if he was hurt, asking him if he could, you know, walk, ask him if they had been booby trapped, you know, he didn't know if they put a suicide vest on him or if there was a, you know, grenade that was set up ready, ready to do for the pin pull. So we did a, uh, with a, coordination with our EOD and explosives check on him, make sure he's okay, and then we started to move, we moved uh, Dr. Joseph outside. And as quickly as I just described what had happened in there, it was about as what, how fast everything had happened in, in just a matter of, a, you know, I would say a few short minutes. Uh, we went from entering in the building to uh, killing five, five of the terrorists and rescuing uh, Dr. Joseph. When we had moved Dr. Joseph outside because we, we were coming on really quickly for first light and we needed to get extracted, I had looked over and I saw that people were working on, uh, on Nick. And so I had asked for a replacement to take over for, uh, for from security detail on Dr. Joseph and I started going over and working on Nick and helping our uh, Air Force pararescue men and, and started to do a head to toe assessment on Nick and, and begin to see what we could do to potentially save his life. After the helicopters landed, 
uh, we, we quickly got on board and they took off. And for the next 40 minutes on our way back to, to uh, uh, Bagram, we, you know, treated Nick's wounds. We did interosterous or IO device uh, IVs and started CPR on him, which we rotated through uh, the entire flight. And it was at that time when we got to the cache, you know, the, the military hospital on base, that the doctors you know, pronounced him dead on the scene. Unfortunately, Nick was um, succumbed to, you know, he was shot in the head, and there was really not much we could do for him. But we knew if there was any chance we owed him that, to get him to a higher echelon of care to decide whether or not, you know, it was for them to decide, the doctors, um, if there's anything more that we could do to save Nick's life. But that was the culmination of uh, December 8th and and how I ended up becoming a Medal of Honor recipient. That, that operation uh, is at the top of the echelon of most decorated um, special operations missions there is. What came out of that, Nick Check was became a Navy Cross recipient, as well as three other people on that operation, along with you know, multiple Bronze Stars and and things of that nature. But as I talked about in the past, it, and and how I I view being a recipient at the end of the day, and I'm just a holder of this medal, and while it's for my personal actions. It is re really, they would never have been able, I, w I would have never been able to do what I have done if it wasn't for my entire team as a whole and how we operated. Nick was a, an absolute uh, warrior and he was fearless. And he, he showed he showed that that night in his immediate actions and his aggression to go save an American doctor. And it, it really is an, an ode back to uh, Clark Schwedler from 2007 to the man of Extortion 17, which is how I ended up on Gold Squadron you know, passing in just a year prior in 2011, and then with Nick Check. So every time I pick up this medal, I think about those three tragic incidences and all the lives of the, of the warriors that were lost that went into me being there on that night and then subsequently being awarded uh, this medal. There is very much a responsibility when you are a holder of this medal, a recipient of this medal, that you have a duty and obligation to promote its values and to tell the citizens of this nation what this represents. You know, this isn't, this isn't winning a Grammy or a Super Bowl ring. This is about fighting for the ideals of our nation and what we stand for as Americans, as being a beacon of hope uh, to the rest of the world. And what comes with, you don't get that for free. And you get that through blood, sweat, and tears of serving your country and going off into foreign lands and doing things that are just, frankly, they're not comprehensible to good majority of, of people in our nation. And so there's a duty and responsibility to talk about why it's why this medal is important and why those traits are important for our society as a whole. It's, it's about sacrifice. It's about having courage to do the tough things.